hard work in both panels, lots of issues covered, I know, in a very short period of time. Um, can I just ask Dave, and perhaps I could start with you, because Paolo Gentiloni said earlier uh, that skills, he said, is at the heart of what makes Europe Smart, social market economy, both a market and social. How do people on your panel assess the state of play? Is Europe doing well in this area or not? Well, I think Commissioner Schmidt noted that you know, we are comp Europe is competing with global economies, China, the United States, Shh. with very different markets and different models that Europeans might not be comfortable with entirely. So there is a uniquely European way of dealing with skills. Uh, and I think also of, of helping workers. We kind of, I think that was a consensus on the panel. I think there were areas of disagreement about how you help workers. Uh, and certainly one interesting uh, subject that came up on the panel was who pays for it? Yeah. Who pays for this reskilling that we're talking about? And Sean, uh, again, Paolo Gentiloni, to quote him, said, uh, if the euro area is to become the engine of prosperity, we need to go further. Was that something, when, when you, I know you were discussing with your panel, are we ready for the next crisis? What was their verdict? Well, we, we had, a, obviously, we were suddenly confronted with talking about the immediate crisis and p potential impact of the coronavirus yep. and actually whether that's going to be a, te a little bit of a test case. But I think uh, the mood generally seemed to be that things probably are reasonably well in place to do that such that another 2008 crisis perhaps wouldn't have the same impact that it did last time, but certainly still a huge amount of work to do and very little is felt like it was totally completed. So there was there was quite a lot of talk about um, getting the deposit insurance scheme sorted out, looking at integrating banking markets and 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 market unions, um, and the capital union as well. Some uh, one of the contributors mentioned that maybe that was more of a priority than the banking union. Mm. Um, and these things, to quote a concrete example, you know, if you if you borrow if you go and borrow. Uh, money to buy your house. It's very different across the whole union as to sort of the rates that you might get and so on. And that means that things are not an e a level playing field. We come back to that term, which we've mentioned a lot uh, today, and that needs some attention. So in terms of, of that, uh, the key challenges as we go ahead, again, the commissioner talked about it being a wake-up call. Uh, this is for fiscal coordination. You've mentioned some of the areas people highlighted. Did they also talk about member states in this? Did they talk about the role at the national level of what we're doing? Or was the focus very much on those EU instruments, as we, it were? We suddenly discovered that the clock was very much against us, I have to say, <laughs> and there was a lot of detail to go in. So we didn't get too much into the detail of, of uh, what uh, needed to be done at member state level, mm. but certainly uh, work to be done there as well. And people member states implementing things in different ways and that definitely needs to be addressed. Right, uh, because I know one of the things Business Europe talks about a lot is we seem to have lost a little bit the structural reform agenda at the national level. We're very much focused on these instruments, very important, but we're not doing the groundwork. So uh, interesting, but as you say, time is always against us uh, in these discussions. And, and Dave, for you, um, I think a little bit of the discussion I heard, uh, there was talk about shaping how we address this goes back to the point Ursula von der Leyen made this morning uh, about we don't just adjust, we need to shape the future and skills seen as absolutely central to shape that future. What were the key challenges that you picked up from that discussion? I think the consensus was th the biggest challenge we're facing is traditional thinking and thinking about education in a very traditional way as something being provided by the state and given to you. Uh, some of the panelists talked about individual responsibility for ensuring their own employability, uh, which I think is a somewhat controversial idea. Uh, we talked a little bit about different geographies in Europe might look at that differently, but I think the the challenge that people realize is that the traditional way of thinking of education, of learning skills, mm. is in a lot of ways not compatible with the changing economy. And so the biggest challenge is just changing the way people think about how they learn new skills mm. and also how they take responsibility for ensuring that they're learning the right skills themselves. And was there a clear priority? You know, I've been pressing all day, telling people, you know, okay, if you were in the commission shoes, what would you do? And asking commission people, if you were a CEO, what would you do? What, did you get a, a, a clear sense of one priority for action that, that pretty much everyone in the panel could agree on, or was it more diffuse than that? 
I think there was agreement that employers need to offer more skills training. Uh, and exactly how you go about that was under discussion. Who pays for it yeah. was under discussion. Uh, and who needs to sacrifice their time even? I mean, there was a discussion about should an employee reasonably expect that sometimes for training, let's say for English language training, it might not be unreasonable to ask them to come in on a weekend because that's something that would behoove them in other areas of life. Okay. And Sean, for you, was there a clear priority, one key thing among all those issues you talked you know, about? I was going to go back to this morning session, actually, because it links quite nicely into some of, into some of what you've just been talking about there and the, the whole, I mean, a lot of enthusiasm for the industrial strategy coming out next week. But I think in terms of skills as well, the message that came across very loudly this morning is that digital is going to change everything fundamentally. Yep. Mm. And uh, any economy that's not ready for that is going to find that it's out of step. And that's absolutely something that, that, that sort of came across very strongly uh, as a key message, certainly from this morning's session. Thank you very much. And on that stock note, ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in thanking Sean and Dave, very much indeed, and thank you for your moderating this afternoon. So, we are, as I say, moving towards the end of the day, but we did want to reflect on these key issues that we've heard about and look at the way forward. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome Valdis Dombrovskis, Executive Vice President of the European Commission for an Economy that Works for People, and welcome back Business Europe Director General Marcus Beira. Uh, they are going to be in conversation. I'm going to leave them to it. <laughs> so, gentlemen, over to you. Well, good afternoon. And first of all, also from my side, welcome uh, Valdis Dombrovskis the executive vice president uh, responsible for an economy that works for people. So therefore, of course, our main counterpart. And of course, my first question is very much about where are we in the economic situation? We have just discussed the downsides. Uh, we know that uh, growth has already been starting to degrade uh, since a while. And now we have this extra challenge uh, with the coronavirus. So mm -hmm. where do you uh, see us, uh, Valdis, and how do you see the upcoming year? Uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, everyone. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, President uh, uh, Gattaz and you, Marcus, for this uh, invitation and uh, possibility to uh, share uh, views on economical developments in uh, uh, Europe with uh, uh, business community. So, uh, on uh, general uh, economic uh, situation, indeed, economy is uh, slowing down. Uh, we uh, saw it uh, already uh, before uh, when we were uh, preparing our latest economic forecast, which was winter economic forecast. Uh, it was at early uh, stages of uh, uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic, so uh, it was not uh, uh, quantified in, but uh, shown as a downsize risk to the economy. So at that time, the forecast was for uh, Euro area economy to grow at 1.2% both this year and next. Now, for example, the latest OECD uh, forecast, which was published uh, earlier uh, this week, uh, shows already 0.8% growth this year, but then rebounding uh, uh, next uh, year. So, and from the information which is uh, uh, currently uh, coming in, indeed, we see that uh, for a number of uh, EU uh, countries, uh, those uh, negative effects of economy are starting to show. So we expect that the first quarter is uh, going to be uh, weak. Uh, how things will develop uh, from uh, there? Uh, of course, it will depend on uh, the overall situation with uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic. If it uh, uh, peaks and recedes uh, relatively uh, quickly, we expect economy rebounding quite uh, swiftly. Uh, if uh, it continues to spread and drag, of course, the situation on uh, economic impact will be more uh, serious. So, uh, therefore, the question, of course, comes, what is our uh, policy response? And just yesterday, we had a uh, Eurogroup phone call uh, to discuss exactly uh, this, uh, clearly outlining that we uh, stand ready to take necessary uh, 
measures as uh, economic uh, uh, situation uh, uh, develops and use all uh, available uh, tools, including uh, fiscal tools. Uh, already now, what uh, member states uh, can do, and uh, those requests are coming in, uh, they can utilize uh, uh, the clause in our uh, fiscal rules, uh, which allows for some uh, additional measures to be uh, financed, which are related to crisis response. And actually, uh, we already are having some first uh, requests for this uh, flexibility to uh, finance the crisis response uh, uh, done by the uh, uh, member states. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, first and foremost, it's uh, not economic issue, it's a public health issue. So, in European Commission, we had a set a dedicated uh, uh, team uh, to deal with uh, this uh, coronavirus epidemic, to coordinate it across uh, the board uh, as regards uh, uh, area of public uh, health, transportation, uh, information and so on and so forth. It regu indeed requires a coordinated approach at EU level and European Commission is uh, working uh, to uh, uh, ensure it. Thank you very much, Waldis. Well, I, I hope that you will be right with the rebound because of course we get a couple of uh, quite uh, critical feedback from a couple of our members. Uh, but of course, uh, let's, uh, let's hope for this. This, of course, is a short-term risk, and this is a cyclical story. Uh, at the same time, there's also the long-term question, uh, how do we get the balance into the European economy? And we had uh, heard a very good uh, speech from President von der Leyen this morning, uh, talking about the Green Deal, industry policy, and, and a couple of other things. And we had a very good debate, and of course, uh, some uh, colleagues were raising the point that there is pretty distinct projects on the Green Deal, and also on social policy. And uh, of course, a question has been raised by some, how do we make sure that this economy that works for people works overall? Because of course, in order to work for people, it needs to work first. Or in other words, I mean, talking uh, about our strategy, mm -hmm. prosperity, people, planet, how do we make sure that this prosperity, this profitability, this economic competitiveness pillar works in order that we are able to also fulfill our climate uh, green and social uh, social goals. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, exactly uh, uh, the ch challenge we are currently uh, facing. Uh, and uh, as you already uh, outlined, it has been uh, discussed, but indeed uh, we are uh, currently uh, facing uh, a green transformation of the economy, uh, move to the carbon neutrality, and the uh, Commission uh, is, uh, uh, as you know, uh, putting forward our proposal on climate law. Uh, we are facing a digital transformation and rapid technological development, and in Europe we are also facing population aging. And all those uh, tendencies will profoundly affect our economies. So uh, the question is uh, how we manage those uh, transformations uh, while preserving uh, European uh, competitiveness, while preserving our prosperity, our social market economy uh, model, and uh, how we do those transformations in a socially acceptable way. So that's exactly uh, the challenge which we are uh, facing. And uh, 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 there, uh, we already have tried to outline our approach in uh, uh, annual sustainable growth uh, uh, strategy, which already published in December last year, showing how we intend to manage those green and digital transformations. Uh, all in all, uh, uh, it uh, should be possible because uh, uh, studies show that uh, the overall impact of green transition and uh, movement to carbon neutral economy is going to have moderately positive effect on the economy and moderately positive effect on jobs, because some jobs will disappear, like for example in coal sector, but at the same time, green economy will be creating many new jobs. So the question here is about uh, managing this transition properly, maintaining our competitiveness, and maintaining our uh, 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 social market economy model.
And on this, uh, uh, there are a number of uh, initiatives which we are uh, putting uh, forward on just transition. We propose just transition mechanism and just transition fund to support regions, sectors of economy and people in those sectors which will be particularly affected by green uh, transformation. Uh, we are uh, proposing uh, a, a border adjustment mechanism to ensure that uh, uh, European economy is not suffering from uh, carbon leakage. Uh, uh, next week we'll be presenting uh, a European uh, uh, industry strategy and SME strategy to see how we manage those uh, green and digital transformations uh, for our industry, for our small and medium uh, enterprises, how we make a full potential of EU uh, single market. So it's a, 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 complex, uh, a, a, a complex endeavor we are engaging, but uh, we think that at the end of the day, it's also opportunity for European economy, for European industry, which was already has competitive advantage in a number of those uh, areas. And when working on those strategies, of course, our intention is to work uh, closely with our uh, business community, with our industry. Well, while this you have already mentioned now the industrial strategy, which will be coming out next week, you know that Business Europe, we have been for many years an advocate for a strong uh, strategic approach to this policy field, because we think we will need it to stay competitive in the world. We'll have another opportunity to talk about this tomorrow morning, actually. Exactly. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit more what to expect from this strategy and what will be the main points and uh, what in this strategy will help us mm -hmm. uh, to keep a competitive edge globally? Uh, okay, what we are uh, presenting in a context of industrial strategy, we are uh, uh, presenting uh, uh, a number of documents, so industrial uh, strategy itself, SME strategy, uh, uh, single market reports, uh, uh, circular economy, so uh, uh, it's uh, quite uh, encompassing. So, uh, and on industrial strategy, once again, we are uh, addressing the question of properly managing uh, green and digital transformations while preserving competitiveness of uh, European economy. Uh, we are uh, looking at issues of um, uh, fair competition, fair competition within EU single market, but also internationally, so uh, looking at our uh, trade defense instruments toolkit, uh, looking at uh, 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 state subsidies uh, and its implications for European economy, also for European public uh, procurement. Uh, so uh, uh, looking at the ways how to ensure uh, international competitiveness of our economy and our uh, companies. Uh, of course, we have single market as our greatest asset, so we are uh, looking at barriers in a single market and how to uh, properly address it. And um, uh, to put simple, we'll propose also the coordination mechanism on this. Uh, because what we are facing uh, right now often is when we see problems with a single market, uh, it's uh, uh, member states saying, ah, it's somehow European Commission not enforcing uh, things properly. Uh, European Commission is saying, oh, those member states are not applying the rules properly. Uh, but uh, what we need, uh, we don't need to point fingers at each other. We need to come together and find solutions to those problems. So we'll be proposing a governance mechanism, coordination mechanism, how we actually address problems uh, in a single market instead of uh, looking uh, uh, who is guilty. Uh, uh, then uh, we will look at uh, um, European uh, industry in terms of uh, what kind of uh, industrial uh, ecosystems uh, we are having from industry, from big companies to SMEs, to startups, uh, uh, research, academia. Uh, identify what challenges, uh, what uh, problems, what risks uh, these industrial ecosystems are uh, facing and also identify a toolkit how we can uh, uh, support these uh, ecosystems uh, in regulatory uh, framework, in access to finance, in uh, other uh, areas. Uh, uh, as I was mentioning, some aspects of um, uh, international competition. Uh, uh, and um, 
uh, we will be further developing our approach of uh, uh, strategic value chains, of uh, industrial alliances, of uh, 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 common European, uh, European projects of common uh, interest. Uh, because we have some good uh, examples, I'm sure uh, Battery Alliance was uh, mentioned here already, so we are going to build on this approach. Uh, probably the first example which comes on uh, mind is uh, Alliance uh, which we intend to propose on uh, clean hydrogen, but also there are other sectors uh, where we are going to develop this uh, uh, approach uh, uh, further. So, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, so uh, 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 once again to uh, summarize the more, more uh, components, managing the green and digital uh, transformations, uh, improving the functioning of the single uh, market, uh, assessing the needs and risks of our industrial uh, ecosystems. Thank you. Well, I mean, you, you know our input on the industrial strategy, and you know that we are very much on board as far as the strategic value chains is concerned. Uh, we also think this ecosystem approach, which uh, has been also alluded to by, uh, by Commissioner Thierry Breton earlier on a hologram, uh, is, uh, is the right approach. Uh, at the same time, we think, and you know this uh, for a while, we also think we need to measure whether we are going to the right direction or not. And we have discussed about this over the last years. But for the time being, what we have is a much too long s system of indicators, which doesn't tell us anything. So what we would be aiming for, and, and my question is, uh, can you imagine this, to have a short list of indicators, industrial indicators, to, to really assess year by year, do we go to the right direction or not, in order to be able to react rapidly. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we think this is important to, to steer the process. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, uh, this is uh, exactly uh, our uh, idea that we would be setting also the uh, forum in a context of uh, 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 European industrial strategy to how this uh, annual uh, follow-up, how the annual uh, assessment uh, to see what is working, what is not working, what are the next things which are uh, needed. Uh, because indeed, we not only need to prepare the uh, strategy, we need to implement the strategy and we need to uh, be able to measure whether our strategy is uh, working and uh, adjust uh, where it's uh, uh, necessary. So uh, in, indeed, that's uh, another Im uh, important uh, element which needs to be mentioned that will be coming with this governance uh, system or uh, forum on uh, EU industrial policy. Thank you. Um, you have also already mentioned the SME strategy and, and you have talked about ecosystems and this is very much our view uh, when we talk about value chains in Europe. We need the, the lighthouses, the leading companies, but of yeah. course we need the SMEs and this needs to work together. Mm -hmm. What do you think we can concretely expect from the SME strategy itself and what will it contain? Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, we uh, see SME strategy as linked in our uh, industrial uh, strategy because when we discuss uh, uh, our industrial ecosystems, as I was uh, mentioning, it's from uh, uh, large companies to SMEs to startups, so we need to uh, cover all uh, players in those uh, uh, ecosystems and we need to ensure that SMEs can uh, thrive in this uh, framework. Uh, at the same time, uh, we know that uh, SMEs are uh, uh, more seriously uh, affected by uh, uh, various uh, risks and negative factors where a uh, large company can survive. It often can be uh, a major problem for uh, uh, SME. So uh, we are looking once again at uh, administrative burden, red tape, uh, how to reduce, how to more systemically apply, uh, for example, SME test in our uh, legislation. Uh, so how we can reduce administrative burden for uh, SMEs. Uh, we are looking in a functioning of a single market for SMEs where uh, especially from SMEs, we are getting uh, uh, feedback that there are still many uh, uh, problems. And 70% uh, of uh, SMEs are saying that uh, uh, single market is not properly functioning, and that's in the area of goods. So I would not even go in an area of services. Uh, so uh, clearly, uh, we need to uh, assess barriers within single market for SMEs because 
cross-border activities, it's even more problematic for SMEs than for large companies, which once again can be uh, better equipped to steer this uh, uh, bureaucracy. Late payments, another issue uh, consistently showing up as a major uh, problem for SMEs. So we'll be looking how to, uh, how to address the problem of late uh, payments. Uh, more broadly, uh, access to finance uh, by SMEs, where the situation is somewhat uneven. There are countries which, uh, where we do not hear so many complaints from SMEs about access to finance, and there are countries which indicate that this is a major problem. So we'll need to uh, work and especially concentrate in those countries, regions, uh, where this is indicated as a major uh, problem, which links me, among other things, uh, also to a question of uh, capital markets union, reducing uh, reliance on bank financing only. So one of the initiatives which we'll be uh, putting forward also in the context of capital markets union will be a, a dedicated fund to support initial public offerings of uh, SMEs to ensure that they can easier and uh, more effectively uh, tap uh, capital uh, uh, markets. So those are probably uh, four uh, areas uh, uh, which uh, we intend to concentrate on, uh, but uh, that's not an exhaustive list. Staying with SMEs, and well, you know, not like you know how the Brussels bubble is, is working. So we, we get leaks, we get the next leak, we compare, we talk to people, we draw our assessments. So one point where we had the impression that it was less prominent in the last leaks is this mm. European inclusive, you know, this 29th uh, company regime. And our conviction was very much that, I mean, this would help specifically SMEs to grow and it would help startups. So we thought this was very useful. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we are aware of the problems uh, and Bernadette Segor is sitting there. We have had this in many cases. As, as soon as we talk about workers' representation on the European level, it gets complicated. But do you see a chance to, to bring this European inclusive to life, or at least to give it a try, knowing that it will not be easy with member states? Uh, well, uh, 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 I can respond with the same. You know how Brussels bubble is uh, functioning, <laughs> and the uh, uh, European Commission is not commenting on leaks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, on uh, substance, if we discuss uh, the question of uh, 29th, or by now maybe 28th regimes, yeah. uh, 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 personally, I'm uh, supportive of this approach. We are trying it in various uh, areas. It's not maybe uh, functioning uh, as well as we hoped. We have this framework, for example, of setting up European companies, but it has not really picked up if you look at this. Uh, but uh, it's definitely worth uh, trying, so I'm uh, ready to engage uh, uh, very closely with, uh, with you, with other stakeholders, and see what can we do uh, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, promote uh, uh, and uh, to advance this approach on uh, 28th regimes. Uh, as you mentioned, we'll be uh, meeting tomorrow morning again. Uh, I may uh, try to think already of more, uh, some, uh, so, some more uh, detailed input in this area. <laughs> Excellent. Mm. Well, I mean, we had a very good and fully fledged program throughout the day, talking about the Green Deal, the industry strategy, SME strategy. We did not in detail talk about circular uh, economy action plan, but, but the president, President von der Leyen, alluded to it. So, and th for the time being, there's all these initiatives. We had the debates in our ranks in the last week, uh, and this was about consistency. I mean, and the, the question is, and my question to you, is how do we make sure that all these strategies which I put at the table now will consistently work mm -hmm. in a similar direction? Or in other words, with a picture of a quadriga, you know, the uh, ancient, uh, ancient mm -hmm. uh, chariots with horses, how do we make sure that these four horses, or at least four horses, mm -hmm. do run to the right direction? Uh, well, uh, indeed, that's uh, an important uh, question, but I would say uh, that uh, uh, the very uh, fact that we are uh, putting out uh, all these uh, documents uh, in the same uh, package uh, reflects also our uh, approach, that we had uh, been uh, preparing them in a coordinated uh, way, ensuring that indeed uh, all the documents uh, 
uh, are uh, helping us address the problems we are facing and uh, that they are not contradicting uh, each other. So uh, I hope we had managed to ensure this, but we are always open to discuss uh, uh, should there uh, any issues be uh, identified. But uh, clearly we need to uh, come with uh, consistent policy and that's exactly our aim. Well, coming back a little bit to the periphery of the Green Deal, a policy field you have been and you are specifically responsible for, which is the Sustainable Europe Investment Plan. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we have talked about this in a couple of panels before. Uh, there is, of course, the transformation. There is the, the necessity to support the front runners. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the success of the Green Deal will come from the transformation of classical industries. Uh, and we have seen, of course, in the debate with the EIB mm -hmm. and the question, uh, will they still continue to finance gas as a bridge technology and so on? So my question is, how do we make sure that the funding, the investment and the, 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 the framework is there to also get the investment in the fields where the big chunk of the changes will come from? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, indeed. So the uh, question is that uh, when we discuss uh, uh, Green Deal, uh, carbon neutrality, uh, that uh, this will require lots of uh, investment. So there are estimates that uh, only to meet our Paris uh, goals for 2030, we need additional 260 billion euros of uh, investment per year. So, uh, 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 clearly, that's a major uh, challenge. That's where our uh, Sustainable Europe Investment Plan comes in, aiming to mobilize one uh, trillion uh, euros of sustainable investment over the next decade. Uh, uh, that's uh, where initiatives of uh, European Investment Bank comes in, with aiming to have half of its financing climate-related by 2025. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, clear that we also need to mobilize lots of private investment and for this we are preparing a next uh, sustainable uh, uh, finance action plan. So how also uh, private sector, private uh, capital can uh, contribu uh, contribute to the greening of uh, economy. Then uh, which economic uh, activities will be eligible under which uh, uh, instruments, uh, that's uh, uh, indeed still be uh, subject to uh, discussion. We are also now, uh, as you know, uh, 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 we have uh, prepared our European taxonomy or classification system of uh, uh, green economic activities. And I think that is a good guidance uh, which uh, direction we are uh, going. Uh, uh, <coughs> for example, you mentioned uh, specifically natural gas in uh, uh, taxonomy uh, proposals, which are uh, currently being worked on. Uh, we, we have this agreement on, uh, as you know, on the governance system, but uh, and technical expert group has already fairly advanced on actual proposals for taxonomies. So what we are um, Having there, we are recognizing indeed natural gas as a transition activity. But there are going to be uh, two types of uh, transition activities. <laughs> so one is, uh, so to say, uh, uh, temporary transition activities, uh, for example, like with natural gas. Uh, because indeed, if we want to meet our emission reduction targets for uh, 2030, uh, uh, it's likely that natural gas will be part of the picture, because if you move away from coal, the fastest uh, way to replace it, it with uh, uh, natural gas. And uh, this is recognized. There is certain criteria like uh, uh, maximum emissions uh, 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 for uh, those new natural gas uh, projects which would qualify under uh, this uh, taxonomy but it's part of the picture. But probably natural gas is not going to be part of the picture by 2050 when we aim at net carbon neutrality. And there are other type of uh, transition activities which we are proposing, which are, uh, so to say, of more uh, permanent nature. Let's take example of uh, steel and cement. Uh, one would assume that also in 2050 we would still need steel and cement so uh, we need to decarbonize those industries which are now currently heavily polluting industries. 
So we are recognizing under taxonomy as transition activities, uh, steel and cement projects, uh, which uh, has emissions substantially below industry averages. So uh, uh, helping this industry to uh, uh, decarbonize. So that's some, uh, some of uh, examples how we are looking at this uh, uh, transition to the carbon neutrality. Well, uh, you also are, of course, responsible for the Economic and Monetary Union in your field of responsibility. We just had a very good speech of Paolo Gentiloni and the good panel downstairs. Uh, and you know that we always stood up to, to that member states should be able to use the necessary flexibility uh, in, the, in, uh, in the stability and growth pact in order to, to do the investments they should do. At the same time, how do we make sure that now in the, let's say, in the wind of the Green Deal and um, in the wave of the coronavirus, nothing happens that, that might cause us problems in the future? Well, uh, that's uh, exactly uh, the point, that Stability and Growth Pact is uh, here for a reason and uh, uh, that we need to ensure uh, sustainability of our uh, public finances and uh, public uh, debt. And this consideration is not uh, going to uh, go away. I think there are certain lessons which we can uh, learn from a global financial and economical crisis. Uh, when uh, uh, there was uh, uh, also lots of uh, uh, discussions, lots of initiatives at the beginning of global financial economical crisis that we need to stimulate economy, we need fiscal stimulus. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, also countries which could not afford uh, doing fiscal stimulus were doing fiscal stimulus. And then uh, a couple of years down the road ended up doing austerity. And some even ended up in uh, programs. So, uh, uh, therefore, it's clear that this uh, debt sustainability consideration is uh, there, uh, something we cannot uh, uh, ignore. Uh, at the same time, it's uh, clear that we need a response uh, to the new challenges we are facing, whether it's uh, challenges like uh, uh, the coronavirus, which are hopefully short-term challenges, uh, or uh, those uh, transformations of our economy. So, we need to see how we can uh, support these uh, transformations, including through our uh, fiscal rules. As regards sh short-term challenges, well, we started this discussion, so I describe a little bit what our reaction, including in fiscal era, is. Uh, as regards uh, longer challenges, we are currently having a public consultation on EU fiscal rules in a context of a review of six-pack and two-pack, which we had. So all stakeholders are welcome to participate. Of course, uh, uh, Business Europe is welcome to participate in this public consultation. Uh, so we intend to close it by the end of the, sorry, by the middle of the year. And by the end of the year, from European Commission side, we will come uh, with uh, 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 ideas, proposals, how we see the way uh, forward. And uh, there, in a public consultation, we are exactly asking these uh, uh, questions on well, complexity of the rules, of how to uh, stimulate green transition and uh, other aspects uh, which are uh, relevant. But another point which I wanted to make here, it's important also to build political consensus on this. Uh, because uh, uh, if we will just have a discussion where some member states and some political parties will be telling us uh, not enough fiscal discipline and others will be telling us too much austerity, uh, we will not be able to get uh, 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 too far. So it's important that we uh, are able to build a consensus that we can then land our fiscal rules in a position which is uh, hopefully better than we are now. Well, well, there's one final question. I think one of the key sentences uh, of uh, President, uh, what President von der Leyen told us this morning is that we either will be a global player or we will be a playground for the others. So my final question is, in 10 years, 2030, there's not only the 2030 targets, uh, will we have achieved this goal? Will we be a global player and how do we get there? Well, uh, uh, that's uh, something uh, we need to uh, uh, work on. It will not happen by itself, 
but we are, uh, if we are successfully in implementing our uh, strategies of managing the uh, green and digital transformations of the economy, and actually uh, in a number of areas there we already have competitive advantage, so we have to use this competitive advantage. Uh, if we uh, successfully develop our uh, industrial strategy, uh, maintaining Europe as an industrial, global industrial leader as it is uh, uh, now, uh, if we successfully uh, strengthen the uh, international role of the Euro, another work stream we are working on, if we do our homework, for example, in uh, uh, completing the economic and monetary union, uh, then I am uh, confident we can achieve that goal. Excellent. Well, Valdis, you can certainly count on the support of the business communities in, in this endeavor. Uh, President Gattas joins me in thanking you for being with us today and for enlightening us on all these very important aspects. And I would say back to Jackie. Thank you very much indeed, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to both thank of you. you for a great end to the day. Thank you so much uh, to you both. You so, much. ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of Business Europe Day, the official part. Anyway, um, I'd just like to end by thanking all our speakers. Um, we have discussed today, we heard at the beginning of the day from Pierre Gattaz, we can make it happen. But there were things that need to be done to enable business to lead that transition in the way that Ursula von der Leyen said we needed to. And I'd like to thank our panels for helping us to chart a way through, looking at both how we meet the challenges and how to make the most of the opportunity. So thank you to our panels, to all our speakers, to our moderators. But most of all, thank you to all of you for coming, for joining in our discussion. And as I mentioned earlier, um, your reward awaits you. If you can stay, drinks will be served outside. Please do stay if you can, enjoy a drink with us, celebrate Business Europe Day, and I wish you a very pleasant evening, whatever you're doing. Thank you all very much indeed.